Good. Welcome back, everyone, to another um, wonderful DPMI seminar session. Uh, today, we are very excited to have um, one of our very own, uh, Dr. Pierre Elias. He is an assistant professor in the Division of Cardiology and the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Columbia University Irving Medical. Medical Center, where he practices as a general cardiologist. He's also the medical director for artificial intelligence at New York Presbyterian. His research lab develops machine learning technologies for medical imaging to improve the detection and management of cardiovascular disease. Uh, and with that, I will let you take it away. Uh, welcome, Dr. Pierre Elias. Thank you so much, Courtney. Oh my gosh, you should do this professionally. That was perfect. Wow. Um, so like Courtney said, um, I'm a cardiologist, I'm a data scientist, uh, I'm a faculty here in DBMI. I've had the lovely opportunity to meet a lot of you. For those who I haven't met, please stop by. Uh, I'm always happy to meet uh, new friendly faces, and I'm always happy to also just chat about things. Um, I've had uh, the fun opportunity to, you know, I left med school and I worked in industry and tech in the Bay Area for a few years, decided to come back, um, have tried a couple of different things uh, through life. Um, and continue to work with different groups in industry. So uh, I'm always uh, happy to just talk with people about where they're at in their journey of kind of trying to do meaningful work in this space. Um, so with that said, I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen and then hopefully this comes up. Um, so first things first, uh, these are my disclosures. Um, some of the work we'll talk about today has been funded by a number of different groups um, in industry. So um, throughout this talk, we're going to use the terms machine learning, deep learning interchangeably. Um, I'm going to start with why I think um, we should care about machine learning and specifically why I do the sort of research that I do. So I'm going to say something that's a little controversial, but um, uh, what's a good talk without a little bit of controversy, which is um, I think that there's a specific time and place to be using uh, advanced machine learning techniques or deep learning techniques. So if you're using things like tabular data, so like things from the electronic health record, like lab results, uh, age, ICD codes, those are what we call very well-featured data. And when you have well-featured data, machine learning is rarely better than traditional statistics. Um, you have very real problems where we need people who do biomedical informatics um, and people who do digital health work, because there's lots of challenges um, with automating analyses, making it fit into the workflow, making things happen. But oftentimes, it's a workflow problem more than it is a methodologic limitation. Um, uh, imaging is a place where I think that's actually quite different. So um, to date, when you talk about the interpretation of medical images, really all we've had is a human expert, which, um, you know, our brains are amazing pattern recognition uh, machines, but they have real flaws and limitations for them. Um, if you need an example of that, you just look at this uh, optical illusion on the right, every single one of those lines is parallel, but your brain is telling you it's not, right? The occipital lobe, um, the visual cortex of your brain, is geared to see certain things, right? It's meant to take physical phenomenon and turn that into patterns that you can understand, but it has very specific limitations of which patterns it can recognize and which ones it can't recognize. Um, on top of that, you know, images represent a huge amount of data that's being left on the table. So one CAT scan is the equivalent of, you know, the entire electronic health record of 500 patients. And traditional statistics, log logistic regression, um, as an example, are really poorly equipped to analyze this data. So you can't use a lot of traditional statistical methods. So for all of those reasons, I think machine learning, specifically deep learning, um, can make a really big difference when we talk about medical imaging. And that's really the place that I focus. So um, here's just one example. So this is a great study um, that came out in JAMA Cardiology a couple of years ago. So um, when our heart beats, it's exchanging deoxygenated blood for oxygenated blood, you know, what we call blue blood for red blood. It's really just a very minor difference in the, in the color of the blood. And there's actually an imperceptible difference in the color of your face when your heart beats. So um, what these researchers in China did is um, they took uh, videos of people's faces and they trained a deep learning model to look at plasmithography, which is kind of the oxygen saturation. So, you know, if you've ever seen those little O2 sats that people wear on their fingers, it was being trained on the plasmithography um, 
uh, waves that people were having. And so then it was able to basically learn from these imperceptible changes in the color of people's faces if their heartbeat was regular or irregular. And one of the most common causes of an irregular heartbeat is an arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation, which puts you at an increased risk of stroke. And we give many of these patients blood thinners. So basically, while people were in a waiting room in their cardiologist's office, they were able um, to uh, detect with greater than 90% accuracy whether they were in sinus rhythm or atrial fibrillation. This is science fiction as far as cardiologists are concerned. This is not just a natural evolution of how we thought things were going to go in cardiology. These are things that when I tell colleagues about it, their minds are completely blown. So we really do have this incredible technology that can help us rethink what we're actually able to do in medicine. So I'm of the belief that AI is going to fundamentally change how we order, acquire, and review medical imaging in the next five years. And what we're trying to do here at New York Presbyterian, at Columbia, at Cornell, is build this world-leading center that develops, validates, and deploys artificial in intelligence technologies for early disease detection. And my group, Cradle, the Cardiovascular and Radiologic Deep Learning Environment, we're really focused on that in cardiovascular disease. So I'm going to tell you a little story from when I was a cardiology fellow. Um, so I was uh, the cardiologist on call, and I was uh, staffing the cardiac ICU here at Milstein. Um, and um, I got called by one of um, our community hospitals and they said, listen, we've got to send a patient to you urgently. I need a bed. So the story is this was a 60 year old man. He had no past medical history whatsoever. And three or four months prior, um, he had had some chest tightness and some shortness of breath. And um, he, uh, his partner took him to the emergency room. They checked him out. They did some blood work. Um, they, uh, uh, they checked his uh, electrocardiogram um, and they said, listen, you've got no evidence of a heart attack. Um, you do have a murmur, a heart murmur when I listen to you on exam. So you should go see your primary care doctor um, about that, but you're not having a heart attack. Everything's, everything's fine. You can go home. So he went home, life got busy. He never made that appointment with his primary care doctor. And three months later, he had the same exact symptoms, chest tightness, shortness of breath. And uh, he came back to the same emergency room. This time, though, he was in respiratory distress. Uh, he had to get intubated and placed on a ventilator. Um, and uh, they quickly discovered by doing an ultrasound of his heart that he had uh, a valvular heart disorder called severe aortic stenosis. Basically, one of the valves in his heart had become extremely restricted and was restricting blood flow to the rest of his body. Um, he um, was immediately sent to us. Uh, Columbia is one of the world leading centers for heart valve disease. We've created some of the procedures that are now used commonplace uh, around the world. Um, and by the time he got to me, he was in multi-organ failure and he died that week. Um, this is a disease that if we had known about it, he could have gotten the same day outpatient procedure and he'd be alive today. So what I learned from that experience is you can't treat the patient you don't know about. And it's a really challenging and complicated process to know about a patient. You have to get the right diagnosis, the right treatment, the right provider at the right time. Um, and there's a number of reasons that have nothing to do with failures of individual people that prevent that from happening with 100% success today. It's a really complicated, expensive, challenging process that we struggle with every day. And we all, every clinician I know loses sleep about. So we have to have some sort of new care paradigm that's gonna be faster, it's gonna be more affordable, that's more equitable and fair and more accurate than our current way of clinically practicing if we're gonna stop things like this from happening. So when you think about AI in medicine right now, oftentimes this is the paradigm that you see. There's a question of can an, artificial intelligence algorithm match physician performance. So for example, you'll have something like you're trying to diagnose pneumonia from a chest X-ray. So um, you have features, which is the chest X-ray or the image, and then you have labels. And those labels will be whether or not a doctor thought there was pneumonia on the chest X-ray. So the human expert's interpretation is the gold standard that you're trying to train and then test the model on. And so there may be a current AI model out there that 70% is accurate as the human expert. 
And then you've created a new AI model, and maybe that new AI model is 80% as accurate as the human expert. So you've built something that's better than the state-of-the-art AI model. And your goal is just to try to get your new model closer to the expert than the old model was. We, um, as a group, we flip this on its head. So I think there's a lot of really important questions in medicine that I'm garbage at as a cardiologist. Um, and so what we ask ourselves is what if instead of using the human expert as the gold standard, we took an important clinical problem that the human expert isn't very good at, and we made our labels upstream, more accurate, more expensive diagnostics tests. And we use those as our labels and the gold standard. Then could our model actually outperform human experts on tasks that we don't think are currently possible? So one way that this could work is we could take first line or very cheap medical tests like electrocardiograms and chest x-rays. And we could potentially see if we could predict and understand how to get the right patients to the second line or further tests, which are a lot more expensive. So the way this would work is we start with the first line tests as our features. We take labels and from these kind of second line tests right here. And then we see, can we predict something from the labels of these secondary tests using the features, which are just these cheaper tests right here. And then we could even do something like take the tests that are very cheap, the tests that are not so cheap, and see if we could actually predict things from tests that are either very rare, very difficult to do, very invasive, or very inexpensive. So let's put this into practice. Let's talk a little more about um, a valve net, which was one of our algorithms that we first created. So valvular heart disease was like um, the disease that I, I mentioned for that patient previously. So you have valves in your heart and basically all of cardiology is like being an electrician and being a plumber. So the plumbing part of it is you have these valves and those valves can become leaky, which we call regurgitation, or they can become rusty and we call that stenosis. And um, valvular heart disease, when it becomes severe, can be life-threatening. Um, the challenge is it can really only be diagnosed with an ultrasound of your heart, which we call an echocardiogram. And it's very expensive. Um, my daughter just had to have uh, an echocardiogram, and then I got a bill for $3,000. Um, um, we uh, also, because of the cost, really only do them once people have symptoms. The thing is, I want to know about your valvular heart disease before you become symptomatic. The earlier I know about it, the better I can take care of it. So we asked ourselves, well, could we diagnose valvular heart disease from an electrocardiogram? So these are kind of the surface electrical activities of the heart um, as we measure from the chest. We have a lot more electrocardiograms than echocardiograms, and it's a much cheaper test. But I, as a cardiologist, I cannot look at an electrocardiogram and try to detect valvular heart disease. So what we asked ourselves is, could we have a deep learning model that um, uh, looks at electrocardiograms done on patients who also have echocardiograms. And could we teach an AI model, hey, this is what the electrocardiogram of someone with valvular heart disease looks like, and this is what the electrocardiogram of someone without valvular heart disease looks like. And we asked ourselves, would an AI model be able to do this? So the first thing is you need a lot of data. So we took data from four different hospitals across uh, New York Presbyterian, the Allen, Columbia, Children's Hospital of New York, and um, NYP Lawrence. And we created this data set of patients who had electrocardiograms and echocardiograms done around the same time. We had to throw out a ton of data, which is so painful, right? When you're trying to build these AI models, you want really big data sets. But we wanted to make sure our model didn't have any form of label leakage or cheating through understanding things that were non-physiologic signals. So patients who had ventricular pacing from a pacemaker, that could clue the, um, that could clue the model into, oh, there's something wrong with their heart. They already have a pacemaker. Uh, patients who had um, ECG artifact. So you would think, oh, well, that would make the ECG harder to interpret. Well, no, actually, you know, um, uh, patients who have a wandering baseline on their electrocardiogram are much more likely to be in the emergency room or the ICU, because if they were in an outpatient setting and you had wandering baseline or a not great ECG, you would just tell the patient to sit still and you do it again. When you're in an emergency setting and the patient is uptunded and um, and altered, um, you don't have that uh, luxury. So actually, there can be great deals of label leakage, even if you're decreasing the quote unquote quality of the study, because there is a random, there's a non-random distribution in who has that decreased quality study. 
Um, and then lastly, patients who didn't have enough comprehensive echocardiographic data where we could really accurately say this is what's going on with the valves of their heart at that moment. Created um, patient-specific trained validation and test sets, um, and as well as a, a holdout hospital for a separate uh, test set. And so this was the paper that we published. And this is, um, a, this is a task that really, as a cardiologist, I would bat 50% at. I cannot look at an electrocardiogram and say, this person has valvular heart disease or not. But on 21,000 patients uh, um, in our test set, our model was able to accurately detect moderate to severe aortic stenosis, regurgitation, and mitral regurgitation, or the presence of uh, any one of the three. Um, and there's nothing super special about this deep learning model. It's really just a ResNet model made for electrocardiographic waveforms. Um, so um, these really off-the-shelf models um, with some minor changes and good pre-processing of our data um, with a good, clinical prob uh, a good clinical problem given to them are able to do things I, as a human expert, can't. So this is great. Retrospectively, it works. Um, in the medical world, retrospective data is not worth a lot. Show me the pro prospective trial of this um, uh, or, uh, or I don't care. Um, and so we said we need to prospectively test this in some way. Um, I think everyone in the room probably knows how hard it is to go from a really interesting research idea and how much of a struggle it was just to get the retrospective data to this idea of actually prospectively testing it. Um, and it's not made better by the limitations we have in prospective trial recruitment. So uh, many of you probably know this. This is the elevator bank right, uh, right here on PH20. This is how we recruit patients in 2023, right? It's like, oh, are you 18 and uh, no recent x-rays? Like, uh, here you go. Uh, we'll give you 20 bucks if you rip off this thing, you know, uh, type in this email address, try to get it all right, and then we'll see if we can recruit you. This is crazy. This is not um, a way to recruit at scale. It certainly is also not a equitable way to recruit patients, right? The sort of people who are going to be showing up and able to pull this off and communicate with you via email or phone number um, is going to really skew the sort of people who are going to who are going to come to you versus the people who may need you the most. So we said we had to do some form of real time detection. How are we going to make this reality? So over the course of a couple of years. We built um, really one of the first end-to-end -end deep learning pipelines that exists in the health system anywhere in the country. So what happens is we have data that comes from different vendor systems across multiple modalities. That data, as soon as it's created, a copy is made and is sent to our research servers. Uh, we use Microsoft Azure as our compute of choice. It's the NYP compute of choice. And basically everything um, about this work now happens um, within um, uh, a compute environment on Azure. So we have blob storage where everything is kept. Um, and then we have compute that's constantly running. And within 10 minutes of an electrocardiogram happening anywhere across any of the eight hospitals at New York Presbyterian, it's sent to our system, it's pre-processed, the deep learning model is run at it, and we could get an insight. We choose to collate that insight and get them twice a day. And then we get that sent out to our clinical trial coordinator. But what we want and what we've really been able to build is across the enterprise, not just at one hospital, across modalities um, and um, across clinical domains, can you use deep learning in real time, get insights, and then deliver that insight to the person who needs to know about it? And so this has been the way that we've actually done our recruitment. So, okay, I've got the mechanisms to recruit patients. Um, I've got the good idea and the retrospective model that works. I should be good to go, right? Well, not so much. Um, uh, if you think about what we've tried to build, there is one major limitation that kept me up for, at night for years. So we have this really interesting idea, which is can we detect um, uh, pathologies that are normally only diagnosed with more advanced tests using the cheaper test? Okay, that's great, but you've trained the model on patients who have both electrocardiograms and echocardiograms. And the patient population of people who have both ECGs and echocardiograms are different than the sort of people who just have electrocardiograms, right? Someone who has an ECG and echo, on average is probably gonna be sicker, they may be older, they've clearly interacted with the health system more probably. So um, all of those things are really going to affect label prevalence. 
And when you think about deep learning version 1.0, the thing that I have to be able to go to other clinicians with is I have to say to them, listen, I ran your model on your patient panel and five patients showed up as positive. The positive predicted value or the precision is 20%. So could I send all five of your patients for an ultrasound of their heart to find one patient with undiagnosed cardiac disease? The positive predictive value is critical to how clinicians think about what they should or shouldn't expose their patients to, right? I'd be more willing to send five patients for an echocardiogram than I would um, some test that was invasive or carried higher risk or involved radiation. So what we had to do is we had to recreate our test set um, at varying prevalence levels, because we don't know what the natural prevalence of undiagnosed valvular heart disease is amongst people who just have electrocardiograms, right? Because you'd have to get a bunch of echocardiograms on those patients. So we used research to say, these are our best guesses. And we said, we think it's probably somewhere between one and 4%, but we modeled out all of these different prevalence levels in the test set, and then looked at all of these PR thresholds, and we said, okay, if I only have to capture the top 20% of undiagnosed disease and the prevalence is 2%, I'm gonna get a positive predictive value of around 18%. And that's good enough to proceed with this trial. So these are some of the things we have to think about before we can actually deploy artificial intelligence models in the real world. Um, we only are gonna get so many shots at this. Um, and you know, uh, even to recruit 200 patients for a clinical trial, was going to spend up the entire grant dollars that we had um, to that day. So we really had to know, is this model going to work? Um, um, and what are the um, basic presumptions we have to make about the patient population um, in order to feel like it's got a chance to work? Um, now, uh, this is where I would show you the preliminary clinical trial results. Um, we've recruited uh, 55 patients thus far um, for ValveNet. Uh, but because this is being recorded and then put on YouTube, I can't share that with you. Um, so maybe we can talk about it after the recording is over. Um, but we're really excited by the results. Um, one of the things that we've learned in the trial is we trained the model to look for a specific label, which was valvular heart disease. And then we started bringing in patients and patients started not having valvular heart disease, but started having all sorts of other cardiac disease cardiac amyloidosis, severe left ventricular hypertrophy, heart failure. And we said, what the heck's going on? And we said, oh, is it possible that this model is pretty good at detecting valvular heart disease, but also the signal to noise ratio between this label and other labels that are similar, other forms of cardiac disease maybe isn't so great. And so what we realized is the question that you probably really wanna answer with these sorts of AI models is of all the people who have an electrocardiogram and no echo, who needs an echo for whatever reason? Not just, oh, specifically valvular heart disease, but all of the reasons I as a clinician and cardiologist would say that person needs an echocardiogram. So the, the, the evolution of ValveNet that's happened over the last year is um, our second generation model called EchoNext. So what we've been developing now is this ECG-based deep learning model to detect a composite label of significant structural heart disease. So that includes moderate or greater valvular heart disease but it also includes people with heart failure, a reduced ejection fraction, people with severe um, left ventricular hypertrophy, people with right ventricular dysfunction, people with a large, a moderate to large uh, pericardial fusion or severe pulmonary hypertension. So the trick here again is we're not trying to tell a clinician how to do their job. If you told me you had a model that was accurate and any one of these things was true about the patient and the patient didn't have an echocardiogram, no one's disputing with you what the next step is. If the model is accurate and it thinks this is true, everyone agrees, you just get an echocardiogram. So you're not trying to change my clinical management. You're trying to say, I think there's undiagnosed and undetected disease. And I would have never expected you as a clinician to be able to diagnose this disease by electrocardiogram. But if you believe that my model is able to accurately do so in your patient population, it thinks that one of these things is true. And this is a test that's really important to do. And so um, this is the sort of way that we feel like we can actually partner with clinicians and get to a point that um, we can find patients with undiagnosed disease and make there be a next obvious step. And then if one of these things is true, that clinician can take back over and say, 
wow, okay, they have a reduced ejection fraction. We need to get them into heart failure clinic. We need to get them on heart failure medications. We need to do a, a coronary uh, catheterization. There's a number of very clear clinical steps. So it's really about finding this gap in clinical care that you can help fill and then let clinical care and the guidelines continue to take care after that. Um, we won't go too much into this, but you know, more data, more data, right? So we've now gone just from using um, West Campus and Columbia data to um, now looking at 12 million electrocardiograms, 1.5 million um, echocardiograms. This is just the single data, which is uh, about half a million, and then that will double when we include all of the things from Accelera. But you can imagine data pre-processing is a bear in general. Now, instead of really building this with like three or four hospitals data that are really aligned because they're all on the same vendor, we're now looking across six different echo labs and sanitizing that data, um, phenotyping, validating it has been quite a process, but we're now at a point where we have a single centralized um, uh, phenotypically mapped um, data set of six echo labs, two vendors, um, all of the electrocardiograms, all the echocardiograms across the health system. Um, and so we're really excited about that. And that's also just an organization level of this sort of cardiac data that's never existed before. Um, so uh, I have uh, a question. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Is it okay. Is it okay to ask a question now? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. So just on the previous slide, I think you, you and I guess you'd mentioned it before as well, where you'd, you'd done a lot of filtering out of sort of poor quality data, like data. Um, I guess this is a question is how, like, when you're building these models, like you obviously want high quality data, but getting access to that in itself can be a challenge. And is that something that you guys would trying to get involved in to improve the data collection processes? Or is that just, look, that's something that happens in a hospital and we just have to do with what we have? This is a great question. Um, so when I think about like, kind of like data quality, I think of, I, I think really kind of in two big ways. So one, there is the data quality at the point of capture. And for the most part, I don't think you can really change the quality of capture in clinical care. Because even if you could change it in like one specific place, you're not gonna be able to change it for all the historic data that came before you. You're not gonna be able to change it at like this clinic and that clinic. So you have to have a good enough question that kind of meets the data where it is. And you say like, yeah, I think that there is in information, like I think there is orthogonal information that is being underutilized on this um, on this feature set, right? Um, and so you have to have good clinical questions, and you have to you know kill yourself to find those right clinical questions and and talk with a bunch of people and all of that. So on that side, I think it's hard to control it. And then the other side really comes down to like you can if you're using good ML principles and building deep learning models, it doesn't matter if you use you know, 1D CNNs, 2D CNNs, transformers, all that. Yes, you need to test it and you need to do a bunch of things. But in general, like if you're abiding by good deep learning principles, there's a number of different models you can use and you don't need to overly fixate on that. You know, good grid search, good model, good principles, you're good. The place where you're gonna have a really big difference in your model performance is your inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, and really understanding what's the pre-processing of the data that needs to happen um, and like, what are the inclusion and exclusion criteria? Really, what's the patient population and clinical scenario that you're creating for your model based off of those criteria? And so that's that's the second way that I think about data curation is um, what are you choosing to feed into the model? What pre-processing techniques are you used? You know, uh, when I did my postdoc at DBMI under uh, Adler Brook, um, I a good chunk of a year was spent just really understanding electrocardiographic waveforms and being like, okay, we have to do baseline wander removal. We have to find ventricular spikes. There was all this sort of kind of pre-processing stuff and that stuff really did make a difference. So understanding your data and understanding the pre-processing and the inclusion exclusion criteria, it matters a lot. And where you don't know, you have to be able to dive in deep, right? So, you know, a lot of this is just kind of manual curation, create a create a random data set of 100 for me, don't tell me what the label is and I'll go verify it and things like that. And a lot of kind of phenotype checking and things like that. Um, but that's why you wanna choose a, a big and good problem because then hopefully it's really useful for you for a long time and hopefully it's useful to a bunch of other people, right? That's part of the reason I wanna tell you guys about this data. If you know it exists, you can start to think about interesting things to do with it. Um, 
So we created all of these labels. Um, we trained individual models. We created multi-layer perceptrons that combined all of these models. And then we just had an individual model that looked at all of them. And lo and behold, it's all the same. The one thing I want to point here is if you ask cardiologists, what two things would they be most accurate at being able to predict from an electrocardiogram? They would probably tell you pericardial effusion um, and, um, and LV wall thickness. And amongst our models, those were the two worst performing ones. So we have all of these preconceived notions of what we can and can't recognize from electrocardiograms as clinicians. And that may not be true at all. Um, and so uh, we really do have to kind of check our assumptions and think through, well, is there information here that is unique that we simply can't see as human experts, but we can get verifiable information some other way? So we now have recruited 55 patients in ValveNet. We're going to close the trial at 100 people, and then we're going to move into ECHO Next, which is the diagnosis of structural heart disease in patients above the age of 60. And so um, we're really excited to, to look at the results of this. Um, and, you know, we, uh, you know, people ask us oftentimes, wow, is this an epic? And we're like, nope, we have no idea how to put this in epic. We still have no idea how we're supposed to display this information to clinicians. So what do we do? We say, like, don't let, um, don't let governance and uncertainty about certain processes on that end prevent you from doing what you think is the important work, which is testing whether or not these models work at all. So we have it as simple as we batch everything as a CSV file that gets sent out at 7 a.m. and noon to myself, my co-investigator, and our clinical trial coordinator. And we literally just have every electrocardiogram, their risk score, whether or not they've had an echocardiogram, and our clinical trial coordinator knows exactly what to do from there. Um, and getting to the rubber, where the rubber meets the road, has taught us so much right? How many of these patients just have echocardiograms that are outside our health system and so we can't see that? How many of these people can we actually help? How many of them are critically ill and at end of life and we're not actually going to be able to help? Um, how many of these people are engaged in outpatient care versus inpatient care? Um, how many of these patients come from disadvantaged backgrounds um, and um, uh, need some form of like additional support and guidance? Um, how beneficial is it to pay them $100 and make sure that you get um, their transportation um, sorted out for the research study. These things really matter. And the only way you're going to know is by doing it. And so um, uh, while we're figuring out how we want this to be front-facing and provider-facing, you know, we've ran this model on over 800,000 um, electrocardiograms uh, in the course of the last year. So we'll figure out the rest, but you got to just start doing stuff. Um, so really, my dream for this is you came to us because you needed a routine knee replacement, but as part of your preoperative workup, you got an electrocardiogram at our community hospital and AI told us you need a cardiologist. So every patient, every episode of care, every hospital gets that same quality of care of, hey, I know you were engaging in a care for this reason, but what I'm really hoping is that we can also take care of your heart while you're here. And knowing that someone who's at a community hospital is getting the same quality of care as if they were at a flagship hospital, or you know that person who comes from a disadvantaged background gets the same quality of care and same AI model run on them as the person who is a donor to the hospital. Um, and whether you see an internal medicine doctor, an orthopedic surgeon, having this as a safety net to try and say, hey, this is someone who I think we need to do more for is really kind of my hope and dream for this sort of work. I'm just going to check and see how we're doing on time here. All right, we're doing okay. Okay, so we're going to change gears for a second. I'm going to tell you a little bit about cardiac amyloidosis. All you need to know about this disease is it's a, a relatively rare cause of heart failure that's often missed until it's too late to treat. It was really a sad story um, for, for decades where people would have heart failure. It would keep getting worse. They wouldn't be responding to treatments. And then they would send them to a tertiary care center like Columbia. Then they'd see one of our experts and they'd say, I think this might be cardiac amyloidosis. And then they would get the diagnosis and then they would have to say to the patient, I'm so sorry, you have cardiac amyloidosis. And they say, well, I have a diagnosis now. And we say, I'm so sorry, there's nothing we can do for you. Um, the only thing we can do is a heart transplant. And oftentimes these patients were already too sick to be candidates for heart transplants. Um, New York Presbyterian, particularly Columbia and Matt Maurer really have changed the course of this disease in the last three to four years. So 
Um, um, we created the first non-invasive way to diagnose this disease, the technetium pyrophosphate scan, which is now kind of used around the world. Also, um, um, uh, Matt wrote, uh, wrote the first New England Journal paper on a medication that has shown to halt cardiac amyloidosis from progressing um, when uh, people are given the medication called tefamidus. Um, uh, the rub is you have to give it to people when they've developed symptoms, but they're not too far along to the disease. And we still don't have a screening test for this. So someone's got to think about this relatively rare diagnosis. So we did this study and we looked at the number of PYP scans, these green bars that we did over the course of four years. And the number of PYP scans we do per year has doubled, but the rate of positivity has remained the same. Um, and what that tells us is we think there's smoking gun evidence that there are a number of people out there undiagnosed with the disease. And honestly, since we wrote this paper back in 2020, there's been huge amounts of information that say it may be an order of magnitude more people with this disease than are currently being diagnosed. Um, just in our data set alone, we have over 2,000 people above the age of 60 who've had an echocardiogram in the last three years with high risk features for cardiac amyloidosis and have never undergone PYP scan. Um, so we built an AI model, first with ECG and then with ECG and echocardiogram. Um, to detect patients with cardiac amyloidosis. And it actually works pretty darn well. Um, and so we're doing the same thing. We are recruiting patients um, uh, for uh, a trial. Now here, the risk is higher. This is a, this is a scan that includes radiation. Um, and we have to make sure these patients don't have another form of cardiac amyloidosis at the same time. So um, we really do have to have a level of confidence that says, hey, um, we, we think you have a life-threatening uh, diagnosis and we're willing to do a test that has um, a radiation associated with it. Also, the amount that we have to be involved in this definitely goes up. Um, every primary care doctor knows what an echocardiogram, almost no primary care doctor has any idea what a pyrophosphate scan is. They've probably never heard of it. Um, they probably haven't even uh, heard of cardiac amyloidosis or haven't thought about it in 10 or 20 years. So you can't ask, um, uh, the, um, the physician routinely engaged in that patient's care to order this test. You have to be deeply involved and champion, um, hey, I think there's something wrong with this patient. We're going to take care of it. I'm a cardiologist. We work with the world leading experts in cardiac amyloidosis. We think this is the right thing to do. So sometimes you want to build stuff that the end user can use. Other times you want to build stuff that the patient needs, but their current care team don't know anything about. Um, when I was talking with Matt Maurer, this world-leading expert in cardiac amyloidosis, he said something very interesting. He said, listen, this is a diagnosis that in our population should be seen in a large number of Black and Caribbean Hispanic patients. Um, one, of, uh, one of the forms of cardiac amyloidosis has a genetic variant, uh, VAL133, um, which is predominantly seen in Blacks and Caribbean Hispanics. Um, and he's like, but my clinic is all white people from Jersey. Like, he's like, what's going on? I don't understand why that's the case. Um, so I said, that's very interesting. Um, so I worked with a number of people, and I'll, I'll show you the wonderful uh, PhD students at DBMI um, who've been leading this work on the next slide. But um, we looked at the race and ethnic backgrounds of people who had different episodes of care. So who shows up at our doorstep at Columbia? So it's about 46% white, 17% black, 38% Hispanic. Okay, who's had an electrocardiogram, a very cheap test? Uh, it's very similar. Uh, who's had an echo, slightly more expensive test? Um, okay, now it's starting to get more white. Who's had a pyrophosphate scan, this highly specialized advanced diagnostic test? Comes overwhelmingly white. So who shows up and engages in care with us at our doorstep is not who we are referring for advanced diagnostic care. So we asked ourselves, can AI actually help with this? Um, so this is phenomenal work that Tony and uh, Katie have been working on, as well as Sneha, who's one of my mentees, who is a cardiology fellow at Stanford. Um, and we asked ourselves, OK, we have an AI model that works, but can we change referral patterns using um, AI? Can we actually build anti-racist AI? So the foundational problem we struggled with is who should or shouldn't go for a pyrophosphate scan? The guidelines don't give us really good uh, recommendations. It just says, oh, per expert opinion. The Mayo Clinic has created this score called the TCAS. And it's a very simple score, right? 
the older they are, the thicker their heart walls, um, the more points they get. And the cutoff is you know, greater than or equal to six. The problem is there's thousands to tens of thousands of patients who meet this criteria who've never gotten a PYP scan in our, in our uh, health system. And we do something like 250 PYP scans a year. You would completely overload the system. You have no justification for this. So we have a diagnostic gray zone, right? So again, you know, the hidden, the, the hidden trick of this talk is where are places where AI can actually make a difference in medicine? So one is what are things that cardiologists or other human experts unable to do that AI can do? Um, another is where are there diagnostic gray zones where risk stratification becomes very difficult? Um, so we have this big gray zone, right? We've got you know, 8,000 or 10,000 people who fit within a diagnostic gray zone, um, but um, we don't know where to go from there. So can AI models further risk stratify beyond this TCAS being greater than or equal to six? And then how do we actually make sure it performs equally well on various race and ethnicities? So the first thing that we did is we looked at all of the patients who are in our AI model previously. So these are people who have had a PYP scan. And we said, let me just look at the people with the TCAS greater than or equal to six, right? So if I look at that group, which the, you know, again, this Mayo Clinic score would say all of them, you should consider cardiac amyloidosis. Well, none of them were negative. What about our deep learning model? So when you look at our deep learning model, it does a really good job of further risk stratifying beyond this um, TCAS greater than or equal to six. So basically it does a good job at saying, even amongst these people who you consider high risk, I can tell the difference between someone who does have cardiac amyloidosis and someone who doesn't. Then we asked ourselves, okay, what if we looked at all of the people in our health system who had a TCAS greater than or equal to six and no PYP scan? And what's the proportion of patients based off race and ethnicity that the model calls positive? And so here, lo and behold, the model is calling almost an exact same amount of these patients across race and ethnicity as positive. So what that means is if you went from the current paradigm of how we refer people for PYP scans right now, it's about 80% white. If you took TCAS greater than or equal to six and you just took those positive patients by race, the racial proportion for referral would go from 80% white to 54% white. So we think AI can profoundly change referral patterns. Um, and um, this is part of what we want to use when we actually are recruiting for our trial. So one of the things that we've built into our trial is we want to make sure at least half the patients we recruit in our trial are Black and Hispanic. And so we want to be using these sorts of methodologies to help us rethink the ways that um, we, can, uh, we can find patients who, um, who need our help. Now, um, I, will, uh, I will share um, an anecdote. So we had a clinical trial coordinator who started with us, uh, Ramon. Ramon's fantastic. Ramon's actually a doctor from the Dominican Republic. And uh, one of the patients who is very, uh, very high risk, um, uh, uh, Ramon, uh, Ramon called. And uh, it was the first patient Ramon ever called uh, after we hired him. And she told him to go F himself on the phone. Uh, we then called uh, her cardiologist, who's a friend of mine, and I said, like, hey, we, we were worried about so-and-so. We think she may have undiagnosed cardiac amyloidosis. And her cardiologist said to me, no, duh, I've been trying to get her a PYP scan for over a year, but she doesn't trust me. She thinks I'm trying to kill her with the blood pressure medications that I'm giving her. So sometimes what happens is you realize you're unearthing the people who need your help, but are struggling to engage with care because of trust issues, because of access issues, because of a number of other equity issues. And there's nothing wrong with that. If anything, I think AI being a way to help us understand where we uh, devote our precious resources to the people who maybe need more care in order to receive equitable health results is a really valuable way to use it. So, um, uh, a project that um, I'm also very excited about is been uh, really led by Shreyas and 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 Victor, um, and this is uh, there we go. Sorry, um, this is um, the idea of being able to detect cardiac structural abnormalities from chest X-rays. So chest X-rays are the most common image of the heart uh, in the world, but we almost never get any meaningful information from them. And most patients who get diagnosed with heart failure only do so when they have stage C heart failure, which is symptomatic heart failure. 
But before that, they developed stage B, which is called cardiac remodeling, where the heart thickens and dilates. So we asked ourselves, could you detect these changes with a test as cheap and prevalent as chest X-ray? And if so, you could repurpose the most common imaging test of the heart in the world as a screening tool for the most common cause of death in the world. So Shreyas has really taken the lead on this and has kind of embarked on this wonderful journey. So what we did is we asked ourselves, could we take uh, patients who had chest X-rays and echocardiograms and validate the model um, uh, to be able to detect severe LVH and dilated left ventricles? So we not only validated this on retrospective data at Stanford, we then had it go head to head on 400 x-rays against 15 radiologists from around the country. Um, and the model outperformed every single one of the radiologists. The first study that shows a AI algorithm outperforming radiologists in the detection of cardiac pathology. Um, and uh, on top of that, we're really excited and fingers crossed it's going to work. We're actually going to be able to uh, hopefully publicly release this entire data set of 70, uh, over 70,000 chest x-rays with their echocardiographic labels uh, and make this publicly available to, um, to everyone. Um, we, uh, oh, and we already talked about uh, this, but we were able to externally validate it at Stanford. Some of the labels did really well, particularly the composite label. Other labels did not translate really well to Stanford's data, and we could never figure out exactly why. Um, uh, we're gonna. Uh, all I'm gonna say here is one of the things that's super exciting about this work is it's this wonderful moment where people are starting to really come out of the woodwork and say, "Hey, we want to be doing AI in a meaningful way." And so we've built this group called Train Cardio, the Task Force for Research Advancement in Artificial Intelligence and Cardiology. So it's this national initiative of groups that are using AI in cardiology that we've led. And so this includes Stanford, Harvard. Uh, Cedar sinai UCSF, um, uh, and uh, a number of others that, I, uh, um, that I'm not including right now. But, um, uh, and it's uh, a great way for us to do multi-site validation, to establish standards and how we should use this data, and really tackle some of the major technical challenges. So one of my favorite projects that came out of this is um, uh, looking at electrocardiogram to adjust 10-year cardiovascular disease risk. So one of the most foundational questions in medicine is, will a cholesterol-lowering medication, a statin, save you from a heart attack or stroke in the next 10 years? So um, we currently look at things like your blood pressure, your weight, your height, your age, um, but we have no simple way to include electrocardiograms into the risk stratification for pooled cohorts equation, which is the equation that we use. So dimensionality reduction is a great place to use um, artificial intelligence. So we built these machine learning models to look at five and 10-year cardiovascular mortality. And through trained cardio, we were able to test on over a million electrocardiograms from Stanford, Cedars, and Columbia. And for the label definition, we just used OMOP, right? We were able to just use an OMOP definition. Weston, who is the PhD student at Stanford, just sent me the OMOP definition. Anna uh, ran, uh, ran it, and um, we were able to provide over 500,000 electrocardiograms. And we proved that these AI models are currently working across site and vendors as far as electrocardiograms go for the pre-processing work. And so what was really interesting from this is if your risk is less than 7.5%, you shouldn't be on a statin. If it's greater than 7.5%, you should be. So if you just look at pool cohorts equation, these were the patients look like. But then if you layer on top of it, patients who are low risk by pool cohorts, but then high risk electrocardiograms, their average risk is 9.76%. So these are people who should be on a statin, but currently aren't by based off guidelines. And then the same is true for these people who are in moderate risk. So um, there is a group of them who their ECG is low risk enough where it would say, hey, they shouldn't be on a statin, but they currently are. So you really can change. This is something that affects 30 million patients in the United States. And these um, also can work um, at the risk. So you could just take an Apple ECG waveform um, and update what people's 10-year cardiovascular disease risk is and turn it into a modifiable risk factor, which would be a really exciting form of work. Um, and, you know, we've talked a lot about label classification uh, tasks, um, but we also do an, um, some interesting work in segmentation. So uh, cardiologists spend a lot of time reading echocardiograms, and it is very boring at times. There's like a lot of tracing and clicking buttons that have to happen. Um, and we asked ourselves, well, we have this incredible data set of all of these expert annotations. Could we build a model that would automatically do all of the segmentation work that a cardiologist currently does? And that's what we've actually been building over the last few months is um, um, a way to diagnose valvular heart disease amongst a number of other things in echocardiogram, 
through doing all the segmentation work. And really the goal here is as soon as the cardiologist opens the echocardiogram, all the segmentation tasks that they would normally spend you know, 10 minutes on um, are completely done for them. And then we're going to give them four different sets of, uh, of labels, um, um, or excuse me, measurements from the echocardiogram. And one of them will be the AI model and three of them will be their colleagues. And we're gonna see, can they tell the difference or not between an AI model doing the measurements and um, a human expert doing them doing the measurements. Um, okay, we're gonna take a break with a funny photo here. This is what AI in uh, healthcare currently feels and looks like. Uh, very, very out of place. So um, I'm gonna uh, rapid fire through these, and these are really just meant to kind of percolate in your mind. So. What I want to do is I want to talk about what are the problems that I think are holding AI back from um, uh, from being in uh, uh, ready uh, ready to go use uh, day to day on a clinical standpoint. So um, one thing is it basically just looks at one image at one point in time. So we don't learn from patient priors. I need to know if this patient has 10 electrocardiograms from the last year or 100 electrocardiograms from the last 10 years, I need one model that can deal with either amount of data um, and can effectively model time and knows that the electrocardiogram from 10 years ago is probably less important than the electrocardiogram from um, a few days ago um, and can actually learn from all of the past features and any past feature label pairs. So if this is interesting to people, we've actually created a data set where we've taken all of the heart transplant data from the last 20 years. So people who get heart transplants, after their heart transplant, they get a biopsy, you know, basically every month for the first year and then once a year. Very expensive, very invasive. But they have all of these kind of perfectly um, annotated feature label pairs, which is they got an electrocardiogram and they got a biopsy. So can you improve model performance on whether or not this patient has heart transplant rejection looking at an electrocardiogram by learning from all of their past feature label pairs? So just in the same way, face ID learns every time, you know, you grow a beard or you put on a hat and it realizes, oh, hey, this is the same person. They're just, they look different now. Um, uh, we want to create models that can be updated by prior feature label pairs. Um, uh, Secondarily, we can't just learn from one data source. So sometimes the answer is on an electrocardiogram, sometimes it's in the lab values, sometimes it's on a CAT scan. So how do you build one model that can actually look across modalities, even if those modalities are very different in size? And is this just an ensemble learning problem where you just build a bunch of models and then you throw a multi-layer perceptron at the end and you, know, you say, okay, we're just fusing all these models. Or do you actually build a single universal model and if so, how do you actually have stable gradient descent um, uh, when the learning rates may be very different because the complexity of the modalities may be very, very different? And you know, really what you see right now is people just say, hey, we tried a bunch of things and this one worked best for our data set. And we need kind of a more disciplined approach than this. Um, we currently build really hyper-specific models. So can one model tell me about a range of heart disease diagnoses without sacrificing significant performance? LVHNet failed at this. When we included more diagnoses in LVHNet, um, it actually did much worse. But ValveNet begged for this. So over here, we have ValveNet and EchoNext, and then we have the model and then the label. So when we just have ValveNet look at valvular heart disease, it does better than ValveNet looking for structural heart disease. But ValveNet looking for valvular heart disease does better than EchoNext looking for valvular heart disease. So these models, they actually have a hunger for looking at expanded labels because the best thing was Echonext looking for structural heart disease. That outperformed everything. So sometimes the idea is <clears throat> there are multiple labels that share information and the model is struggling because it's like, I can't tell this pathology from that pathology, but do you really care if it's just picking up pathology versus no pathology? So uh, understanding these kind of multitask questions is really, really important. And then model generalizability to new sites. So I built a model at Columbia and now I wanna go run it at seven other hospitals. I have no idea how to do this. Um, um, covariate shift, label shift, conditional shift, all three of those really, really have a big impact. So there's no reason to think that anything about the data at Columbia is identical as it is at Cornell. The prevalence of disease, the average severity of the people who do have a positive label for disease, the patient population and comorbidities, the ordering practices of providers, 
the even the way the data is acquired and the vendors that are you that are being used, all of that is different every single time. So how the heck do I actually create a model that's generalizable from one site to another? This is a really big problem, and we are actually facing it because we have a model. It currently is shadow running at every single hospital across NYP, but we're only recruiting patients from one place. And I'm trying to figure out how do I know that it's okay to go ahead and start trying to recruit patients from other sites? Do I train the model at Columbia and test at Cornell? Do I blend the data sets from all of the different sites and test it that way? Do I cross-validate, build one model at Columbia, build one model at Cornell and cross-validate across the two? Um, these are some of the questions that we are you know, struggling with and thinking through right now. So with that, I will say thank you. This is our lovely um, uh, group cradle um, at our last on-site meeting. So thank you so much for having me and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions that people may have. Thank you so much. All right, do we have any questions? Um, if so, can you use the Zoom function to raise your hand and then that way I'll be able to see you. All right, uh, C, go for it. Uh, hi, it's a really, really wonderful topic and uh, it's so fascinating. And um, I'm kind of curious, for example, we are trying to um, actually using your model for the providers in the hospital to the patients. Like, will you generally tell your patients that, okay, we are going to use the AI model um, to predict whether you are having a heart disease and we are going to refer you to a further test based on the AI model. Because actually, I think you are asking your patients to do a, a more expensive and even possibly um, invasive test. So yeah, I'm wondering whether that's a problem because nowadays it's a very, a very hot topic on um, how to use AI on human and things like that. Yeah, it's a fantastic question. So right now, this is just clinical trial investigation. So basically every patient that gets recruited, first we get the approval of their clinician if they have a clinician that's actively engaged in their care saying, hey, we're doing a research study, we're a cardiology team, um, our AI model flagged this patient as potentially having undiagnosed disease. Once we have their approval, we then go to the patient and we explain to the patient, listen, we have an AI model that is currently running. This is a research study. We'd like to recruit you for this research study and determine is this AI model accurate or not? So everyone knows like this is an investigational device and, um, and we're using it in this way. Now, when you think about actually using this, what are the important things? Like, let's say this is an, approve, an approved technology. It's an FDA approved technology and stuff like that that we've turned it on, right? Um, what, um, what things should and shouldn't we um, be obliged to tell patients? So as a clinician, I don't sit there and explain to a patient, hey, this, here's how this laboratory result works for every single thing that I'm doing, right? Because they say, well, you're just doing routine clinical care and you're trying to take care of me. I don't sit there and say, hey, I take your blood and um, you know, we spin down your blood and then we put it into um, a, um, uh, a photospectrometer and uh, it will then look for these sorts of analytes. These analytes are correlated with this thing. There was a clinical trial done 18 years ago, which showed that if this level is this, you know, it means this, right? We just say red number bad, green number good, we need to do this, right? So yeah, there is this kind of inherent struggle of what, what should and shouldn't you tell patients? Um, and that's one of those things that I think we're, we're navigating. Even what, sh what do and don't you tell uh, clinicians or how do you uh, make clinicians feel comfortable with the AI model is a big question. What I think is at the end of the day, like there are things that are unique about AI and then there are a lot of things that aren't. So whatever technology and medical devices have come in the past, they've had to go through rigorous prospective clinical testing, right? So they've had to go through prospective clinical trials um, and FDA approval to be used extensively. And I think we have to hold AI to that same exact standard. The reality is, um, I think that if you hold it to that standard, there's a lot of the concerns about black box AI stuff will actually be less important because the true reality is, there are things that I order every single day where it's a vial of blood and it literally goes into a black box. I have no idea what's happening inside of that black box, but I trust the medical complex to have told me 
a clinical trial was done on this and red number bad, green number good. Um, that's the only way a clinician can make it through their day, right? They can't know about every single thing. Now, we should try to understand how these AI models work, and we should be very cautious and suspicious of them. But we don't have to recreate everything about the way that we do modern medicine just because of AI. So I think prospective trials, randomized trials, thoughtful implementation and understanding like we're still very early on in this are the most important things. Great question. Yeah, thank you very much. Fantastic. And I know we're a little over the hour. Are you okay staying for this last question? Yeah, okay, absolutely. Perfect. Uh, go ahead, Fengyi. Oh, hello. Yeah, I really like a topic and your great research. And one question I have is that when you apply deep learning models on ECG signals, do we build a generic uh, classifier or we perform some sort of like customizations for patients just because like, you know, each patient may have different biological characteristics and various responses when a disease occur. So. Could you ask, could you ask the question again, Peggy? I don't oh, think yeah, I, sorry. I so I was it. wondering, do we apply, do we build a generic classifier or we perform some sort of customizations for the patients when we using this deep learning models? Got it. Um, so the most important thing is probably the adjustment in the inclusion and exclusion criteria in the training data and how and 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 what you decide to put in the test set. So that's the first thing is like, who are you really training this model on? And is that an appropriate group to train the model on? Um, we try a number of different labels, whether they're more finite or um, or broader. Um, and then we take a couple of patient specific characteristics that aren't necessarily just the electrocardiographic waveform. So we try to not include electrocard elect elect electronic health record data at all, because we think there's a lot of confounding that can exist there. And then also, as far as how well your model is going to work from one place to another, we know the way people document everything in EHRs is super, super um, variable. We'd love to get to a point where it's like, you know, everyone's data is like really sanitized and homopified, and you could just be like, boom, you know, we, we can do that. But really, we're trying to say, can you take physiologic imaging data and prove that it works? So we take a couple of simple things like age and sex. Um, as well as some electric cardiographic features like the RR interval or the PR interval, and we include those. But even with that small amount of data, we've like seen really kind of silly things happen. So an example is like um, the list is always um, uh, uh, rank ordered by highest risk patients at the top. And over and over again, I was seeing this thing where um, Jane Doe's and John Doe's, um, um, so patients who we don't know their name or we don't know anything about them, were coming super high at the list. And I was like, that's weird. Granted, when someone comes in as a John Doe, they're probably coming in pretty sick to the hospital. But I was like, why is it that they keep getting so high on the list? Um, and then one day it hit me like a bolt of lightning, which is um, when, um, when you come in as like Jane Doe or John Doe, um, we set your date of birth to January 1st, 1900. And so the model was calculating that all these people were like 123 years old, and it knows that cardiac disease is more common in older people. So it was like, oh my God, I've never seen someone as old as you. Um, you must have cardiac disease, right? And so um, even silly things like that, as soon as you start including tabular data, you have to be careful for. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that's how we try to kind of balance those things out of giving a patient-specific data without giving it things that can cause label leakage or confounding. Yeah, thank you. All righty, well, if there aren't any other questions, uh, we'll wrap up here. Thank you so much again for that fantastic presentation. Um, everyone, uh, let's give a big thank you and round of applause again. And with that, we'll close out the seminar today. Thank you.